this is um, a great um, opportunity for uh, Passive Buildings Canada to partner with um, Passive House Alberta uh, just to um, show you these videos today and it's thrilling for me because I am part, a part of both of these organizations and, and really like to see the collaboration between the two. Okay, I'll let Frank take it away. Great, all right, thank you, Kim. Uh, hopefully everyone can see me and hear me and the slides should be up. So we're here today to talk about some, I guess, fabulous high performance uh, construction videos. And I guess a little bit started saying just uh, what Passive House Alberta is. So we are a nonprofit working in Alberta to promote high performance building and specifically Passive House Vision, Alberta, sorry, Alberta. Passive House Alberta's vision is that Passive House is the standard for the built environment in Alberta and it's accessible and affordable to all. Uh, briefly, my name is Frank Crawford. I'm a certified Passive House designer and a certified Passive House tradesperson and a civil engineer. Uh, I've been working in construction for about 20 years. The last eight years have been more on the energy efficiency and high performance building side and I'm the education committee lead for Passive House Alberta. So um, I have to thank the sponsor or the grant grantor for uh, providing the funds to uh, create these videos. So SSRA, which is the Smart Sustainable Resilient Infrastructure Association, provided all the funding for uh, us to create these videos. So uh, a large thank you to them. Without them, these would not exist. So what are these videos? Why are these videos different? Why would you care? We realize that there's a lot of videos out there right now uh, doing a lot of different things. So kind of why are ours a bit different? So first of all, when we kind of got the grant and started to create those videos, we sent out a survey to a number of people in Alberta and kind of a little more na Canadian nationwide to ask them what is kind of missing or what they see as gaps uh, currently in the videos that are produced um, to see what was missing, to see what we want to fill in. So it wasn't just what we thought we needed, it's what uh, other people um, thought was needed, it's missing. Uh, we're also product agnostic, so there was no product funding for any of the marketing or any of the videos in here. Uh, we were a fully grant funded, so we didn't need any marketing funding. Obviously, products are shown because when you build something, you use products. But the products we picked, we picked because they are showing the process and the technique in a high performance passive house way. We got no funding from them. And so it's not just marketing hype. Uh, it is more detailed, uh, more specific. We try to get into as many details as we can. However, it is always a, a trade off between being just an installation video for this product on versus how to install a type of product uh, correctly. So we try to, to be more on the ladder where we're trying to be this type of product. This is how you install it correctly and be as detailed as we can within the time that we have um, to do that. We're not just pretty pictures. There are pretty pictures in it, but we're not just pretty pictures. Uh, we're always based on building science and thermodynamics. That's how the passive house standard is based. So that's where we always start from as well. And, and as we kind of created these videos, there was a, an editing and reviewing process. So again, it wasn't just us. We sent it out to a number of different institutions in Alberta primary to take a look at the videos to make sure that what we are creating is actually correct and useful and informative. So we hope that uh, you agree with that. So what is actually available? Uh, it's two plus hours of uh, videos showing specifically cold climate, high performance construction and passive house techniques and processes. It's not purely passive house. We kind of opened it up to more of this, the high performance construction market, which is a more kind of general term, uh, but still always having that building science and thermodynamics behind it, but over two hours of uh, videos. And we realized that no one's gonna sit down and watch two straight hours. So it's segmented into kind of longer sections that maybe uh, are kind of between the five to kind of 37 minutes long. Those are kind of one area or one location or one kind of building type. But even those realize start to get long for people to watch. Um, so since we're 
hoping that educational institutions and organizations use these in training. Each one of those longer videos is separated up into each individual topic, and those individual topics are then sortable um, and searchable by uh, name so that you can get down to like one or two or three minute sections. And those, those are what we're going to be showing today that you can, if you're teaching a course on that topic, you're hopefully to find a video that kind of helps um, either supplement what you're teaching or lead into what you're teaching. So briefly speaking, some of the topics that are covered are air tightness, wall assemblies, window installation, thermal bridge mitigation, integrated project delivery, HVAC systems, and deep energy retrofits. So kind of what is the goal for this project? Uh, our goal is to improve the skill level of trades and designers working in cold climates and specifically help educational institutions organizations and individuals uh, access the video library and we want them to use them in their training courses and programs. So it's not a full training program in it itself because uh, that is very hard to kind of pick what to train, but it is individual videos that can be used within either an existing or a new to be created training program. And what are we offering? So there is a bit of a cost involved and the fees vary by the type of group and the access that you need. Basically, do you want to just to view the videos or do you want to download the videos? And if you do pay for the downloading uh, of the video ability, then once you've downloaded the videos, you are allowed to edit them um, however you please to kind of better fit them into your needs. We don't want to restrict them, restrict you on how you use them once you uh, down, are able to download them. And uh, as kind of, uh, I guess, uh, the, the, the lower cost access, if you are a Passive House Alberta member, and membership starts at $40 per year, you get free view only access to all of the videos. So that can kind of be a teaser as an individual, you can go in and look at all the videos. If you see you like them and you work for a larger company or educational institution, then maybe you pay for the, the larger download. And if you pay kind of the, the full price, you can get to download the videos and view the videos. And it's $1,000 for all two hours um, or about $300, $295 if you want one single um, video. And then you have access to use those videos as you wish for kind of a five year term. So fairly reasonable, um, but still some compensation for uh, the, uh, the time and effort that was put into these. And the videos are all on the Vimeo uh, web or video serving, uh, video sharing service. So you can access this on a website. They are uh, password protected, but that website allows you to search function. It um, uh, also has a contact function. So if you're watching the video and you have a question, you can hit that kind of contact or mail button and that will send us an email. And you can also sort and they're searchable. So all of the longer videos are sorted by number one through nine to show up at the front. And then after that, it's sorted alphabetically, but there is a search function within the, the Vimeo platform. The only thing that we ask is that we don't want these videos kind of reposted on the internet uh, on a free service at this point, uh, because we do believe that you need to have some type of instruction and some type of context behind the videos. Um, otherwise, if they're just thrown up um, randomly, then you kind of that context is lost. And uh, that's what we don't want that to happen. We feel that uh, the educational and the, or an instructor having some com some comments about it is, is really where you get the full learning out of these videos. So now let's actually start watching some of these videos. Now I've turned them, uh, talked to you all about them. So what we'll do is we'll kind of show a few short sections of the videos. If you guys have any comments, feel free to put them in the chat box uh, or you can turn your video on and talk. It is being recorded. So um, you just might want to put them in the chat box if you don't want to have your, your face and voice on the, uh, the internet. But give me a sec to uh, change the view and we'll look at some videos. One sec. There we go. Took me a while to find it. Apologies. So 
here is the first video. Um, and the reason we picked this one is it shows not just a tr skilled trades person, but a skilled trades woman uh, talking about um, air tightness and continuity of air barriers. So in any deep energy retrofit, one of the first steps that you have to do is kind of disassemble a little bit just so that you can actually find out what is on site and what's existing. So for this project, we once we removed the uh, existing siding, we did find that in some parts there was stucco. Uh, the stucco was determined to be airtight enough uh, that anywhere that we came across cracks, we were able to seal them. Uh, for another portion of the house, we just found uh, wood. So in that case, we applied a liquid applied air barrier. Um, for this attic space here, what we ended up doing is removing the sheathing so that we had access to the attic and uh, that allows us to gain access as well as remove any insulation that needed to be fixed. Um, it will be reapplied and then we will be air sealing it once we're done the project. So this detail here, we're able to see how with the existing window, we're able to tie it into the stucco so that we have a continuous air barrier. Uh, we did use the EFIS tape. Um, we did find that uh, the adhesion between the EFIS tape and the stucco wasn't uh, enough to get uh, a really solid air barrier. So this is where we use the liquid applied flashing. So here with this detail, you're able to see a drainage gap in between the existing wall as well as the uh, insulation layer and this is created by the trowel marks um, when the cement is actually applied so that any moisture that comes out of the wall is able to drain down and out. Yeah so I really like that video it shows kind of how uh, when you're dealing with an air barrier that sometimes it's better to call it an air control layer because it's never just one material it's all how you combine a number of different materials to create one continuous um, air barrier and in this uh, example it was using the EFIS system the exterior insulation finish system on a deep energy retrofit of an existing home and how all those different layers come together uh, the other nice thing was that uh, Celia is actually one of two women on that crew that is doing those deep energy retrofits. So we like to see um, not just men in construction, so having more diversity in construction and kind of those deep energy retrofits where you're more just lifting up the insulation and foam might be one of those areas in addition to like maybe air barriers where um, women or other people can uh, join construction where there's less of a kind of the, there's less heavy lifting that might um, otherwise restrict their interest in joining that. So that's one of the first videos. Uh, we're now gonna kind of switch gears a bit. Actually, if there isn't any questions or any comments on those videos, feel free to unmute or type them in. But if not, then we'll go on to a, another video. This is a uh, new build um, using a TGI outrigger uh, wall assembly. As we continue out this deep window roughing, the plywood that we saw from the inside is acting as a combined air and vapor barrier. So all of the joints have to be taped with a high performance vapor open stretchy tape. To increase the insulation, they make a cavity. The cavity is made with a TGI or a wood I-beam. And then this cavity will be covered with wood fiberboard and a weather resistant barrier. The cavity will be filled with dense packed cellulose. So when you take all these different insulations, it ends up with a very high performance wall system that's called either a TGI outrigger or an I-beam outrigger or sometimes just another type of split insulated wall. From the inside, this is a very typical two by six framed wall. They still try to use advanced framing techniques to minimize the amount of lumber, but it is your basic standard construction. But if we come to this window, you can see that it's sheathed with plywood and you can tell by how deep it is that it really isn't a code minimum wall. So this uh, video was from a uh, passive house uh, building being built in Bragg Creek, cold climate uh, uh, in Alberta, and shows a kind of carbon sequestering wall assembly using lots of dense packed cellulose. 
uh, and other low embodied carbon insulation kind of uh, presents the uh, principle of smart vapor barriers, uh, which are just those vapor barriers that can change their permeability depending on the relative humidity of the wall and kind of showing how the, the that wall assembly uh, gets made. So I think and if there's any questions, feel free to talk. And if not, we might go on to another one from this location talking about how we actually install the windows into that uh, wood eye joist wall. So this deep wood window rough in buckout serves a number of purposes. The primary purpose, obviously, is to transfer the vapor barrier from the inside to the outside because the plywood is a vapor barrier when it is taped with high performance tape. The second function is that when the weather resistant barrier that's going to be applied to the outside is returned back in, it connects that membrane from the outside to the inside. Finally, it gives us lots of structure to be able to install our high performance triple pane windows anywhere within that rough opening. Ideally, the windows are installed in the thermal center of the wall because that is where they are the highest performing, but that might change within an inch or two depending on the actual window install detail. Talking about windows, there's a number of different factors that makes up the total performance of that window. Obviously, there's the glass, there's the frame, but then equally important to that is how that window gets installed. Because if you have a really high performing window and you install it poorly, the window will perform poorly. So we want to maintain the performance of that window. So here is one excellent detail on how we install this window in a high performance building. So first of all, we would structurally attach the window. You can use clips or screws. There's various different methods depending on the installer, but then you want to come back and on all four sides on the inside, we use a high performance tape to connect the vapor barrier of the wall to the vapor barrier of the window because the window is part of your air and vapor barrier system. So that tape is high performance. It is very sticky, it is stretchy, and it has similar permeance ratings as the rest of the assembly. The reason you want it really sticky is because the wall might move, the window might stretch over time, and that stickiness and stretchiness maintains the air tightness over the 50 to 100 years that this wall is going to be here and this building is gonna be here. So all four sides are taped the wall to the frame on the inside. On the outside, at least the top three sides are taped. The sill on the outside is dealt with a little bit differently. And then next, we want to try to reduce the thermal bridging of this installation. So on the jams and will be on the head, they've installed about a half inch of insulation here. This helps reduce the thermal bridging of this connection detail. And then on the sill, because the outside of the sill is sloped down and you can't really insulate it out on the outside, we've put about two inches of insulation on the inside of the sill. And all of these details combine to make an excellent high performance window installation detail. So here's the next progression on that window installation detail. Remember we still have the foam here. We have the foam behind this piece of wood. We now put the drywall on. The drywall gets mudded and taped and painted. You can caulk the, to the seal. It's not part of the airtight membrane. It just gives a nice look. And then you might want to put a more durable material on the sill because people often put pots or plants or something because they have a nice deep sill here. But one thing you want to make sure is you leave yourself enough space so that when you open your operable window, you're not hitting any of the materials. But you can still hide as much of that frame as you can with insulation. So in that video, we kind of showed one of the ways that you can uh, install a window and a high performance wall kind of in the thermal center and a number of the other kind of main principles that we look at for installing windows. But obviously, there is different ways to do it. That's just one of the ways that was uh, done at this site that, uh, that we um, recommend or, or like seeing done. So if there isn't any thoughts on that one, then maybe we'll go on and maybe switch a little bit to um, some filming we did at more of a multifamily residential building, which is more of a commercial type of wall, and talk about some of the connection details for that air tightness layer, kind of going from your wall up to uh, your roof.
So this location, we're at the wall to roof transition and we're seeing how the vapor barrier is made continuous around that detail. Although it can be a similar detail to at rim joists. So if you look up, these are actually the roof rafters and behind that red tuck tape and above that is a thick poly vapor barrier. Vapor barrier always being on the warm side. So it is currently just stuck to the wall but the vapor barrier on the wall will be attached to it. But it's there now because when these roof rafters were installed, the vapor barrier goes underneath it and up the outside, outside the rim joist, and then back on top to connect to the roof membrane above this plywood. And then to make sure we're continuing the same R value at this rim joist or roof joist location, on the outside of that, we still have a large thickness of EPS foam outside of that vapor barrier. So that was a more kind of commercial uh, type wall assembly, although it could be used in residential, but showing kind of how you have that continuity of the vapor barrier at various transitions and also how to make sure that you minimize the uh, thermal bridging uh, at that location. So um, I think what we might do is take a quick break from the videos and maybe switch to one other uh, item that kind of came up when we were uh, reviewing and creating all of these videos. Uh, some of you might have noticed that there was uh, some fairly nice 3D models uh, used. And the company that creates those 3D models is called Beyond Code uh, and it's beyondcode.net is their, um, uh, website that you can contact them. And what they do is they are a company that create high performance, very detailed 3D models for both educational and kind of commercial or, or residential use. So if you're an education committee, uh, educational institution, you can contact them and they can kind of set you up with kind of a, a per seat um, uh, viewing ability to view a number of their models. And as you can see here, the models are very detailed. Uh, it, I really like that you can actually now view um, highlighted the water control layer, the air control layer, you can see the thermal control layer. And then if you're more of a, a builder, what you can actually use these models for is actually kind of a virtual mock-up or a virtual uh, kind of walkthrough because they break down the uh, construction step by step. So you start with the studs, uh, you add on your plywood, you add on your window rough opening, taping all of the different sides, showing you all the different views of where all the tape needs to go. Then you start to add in your sloped sill uh, to make sure that you have good drainage away from the window on the sill. You can also add some insulation at the corners and we have a video on that corner insulation. And then just kind of goes all the way through. You start adding the um, dense pack cellulose, water resistant membrane. And then it even gets down to showing you how you actually tape every one of those rough openings. And then you eventually get down to installing the window. So again, this, you can use these and they would give you step-by-step -step PDFs that you can give to the trades on site and say, this is how you install this window, or this is how you install this whole wall assembly step-by-step. -step. And it um, definitely makes a transition from a 2D black and white drawing to real life much quicker. So that's why we're, we're um, fairly impressed with these um, details that were created by Beyond Code and why we have included them uh, in the videos. So you can contact them ac directly if you want access or want to purchase them. They have both a kind of increasing library of existing details that you can draw from, or they will help you create your own custom details for how you build your walls or assemblies. And it's obviously using the, the SketchUp um, and Trimble Connect um, software package. All right, so now we'll go back to a few more videos, but I think maybe we will maybe change to kind of show you some of the, the, the breadth of different types of videos that we are um, providing. So let's maybe look at, uh, maybe this is more one for the designers and the kind of architectural technologists out there talking a little bit about the integrated project delivery and massing. And this one actually features uh, Kim in it.
An integrated design process, what that means to me is the ability to get many more people at the table earlier. So the design team is integrated, the workflow is integrated, the information is shared much more openly than in a, a closed, a more closed system where it's design, bid, build. Pretty common uh, practice for larger buildings, but in a smaller project, it may not be as extensive. The most important parts of the team are the owner, the general contractor, and any of the design team, so that might be engineers that might be involved in the project, because everyone has great input into how best to execute various parts of the project and successfully and on budget and on time. There is a, a very well-defined myth that I need to keep everybody separate and bid it to death after the fact because somebody will be dumb enough to give me a low enough price that saves me money. That's a complete myth. The reality is if you invest people earlier and make them a part of your project earlier, hold them accountable to some transparency around cost and help you understand cost, you're not going to get surprises the end result is more likely to be closer to what you expected. And you're, you're going to have a fully invested group of trades and technical specialists, as opposed to people who did a low bid and are now working for themselves. Some people like to use the term massing uh, in terms of what a building looks like and if you're a passive house enthusiast you might use the term form factor, both of which are pretty darn confusing. So I think uh, when we're talking about what a building looks like um, on any site, the first thing we want to think about is orientation, where it is in the world, uh, climate wise, um, those sorts of things are really affect the type of building and the form that the building would take. You want the area of the external envelope, both ceiling, floor, walls, to the volume next inside the building to be as efficient as possible. After a circle, a cube is the next best shape that a building can be. Now in terms of achieving energy goals, the way a building is orientated and configured the way um, natural shading from trees and vegetation are utilized. All these are, are decisions that can be made that reduce how much the energy systems of the building itself will have to compensate for. And so if you can reduce a building in terms of how it takes on solar gain, how it is exposed to wind, etc., etc., and through the massing stages make these key decisions, they're intelligently linked to your final product. And then basically through smart design of all these elements, then you're not having to install systems that are really there to compensate for, frankly, what is bad design and lazy design that hasn't taken the time to maximize the building envelope performance and all these other elements. Starting to exclude things that come out of the building from the inside to the outside, cantilevers and, and bump outs. Those sorts of things start to um, make the building more complex, more expensive, and also start to eat into the energy requirements for the building. Passive houses, they tend to have a higher level of comfort. Now, if you chase energy efficiency far enough and you keep health and comfort in mind with all those parameters for humidity, temperature, drafts, cold spaces and hot spaces, how it feels in your toes compared to your head. If we chase energy efficiency hard enough, the better off that you are for a, from a health and comfort point of view. Everybody wants to be safe, secure, comfortable in their home. Everybody doesn't want their buildings to be costing them too much. Drama is a pretty interesting part of any building and drama often means vaulted ceilings and or vaulted spaces. There's ways of doing all of those things without 
creating all kinds of articulations um, in order to keep the building compact. Illusions of vaulted space can really help in terms of form of the building. The simpler it is, the easier it is to build, the less expensive it is to operate. And it's not that all buildings have to be square and ugly. A simple form can be beautiful and they happen to have a reasonable area to volume ratio. In terms of multifamily or affordable housing, decreasing the utility costs is a no-brainer. When we build better, these buildings will be robust and last for centuries. So I like that video, I think it very uh, succinctly and, and uh, completely shows kind of that you need to start your design from the very, very beginning to make sure that it ends up being efficient. So start with those compactness, those massing, those, those um, thoughtful decisions at the beginning, make an impact at the end and make the cost to um, make it energy efficient much less than it would be otherwise. So yeah, really like that video and hopefully lots more architects um, start to see it and we get some maybe some simplification um, or more thoughtful uh, design out there. Uh, so another kind of different type of video that will show a sample of uh, is uh, looking at retrofits and a retrofit mechanical system. So there is about 30 minutes um, on uh, two deep energy retrofits of uh, two existing buildings in Calgary. And one of them included the mechanical system, which we will uh, see now. All right, we're here down in the basement where the furnace used to be, and it has been replaced with a multi-position heat pump air handler system. So the multi-position just means that this unit could go this way or run this way. So it could be installed in some fairly tight, constrained spaces, but it's running up and down now. And then you starting at the bottom, you have some filters. Here you have your fan. Here you have your two refrigerant lines. These refrigerant lines bring the hot and cold refrigerant from the outside condensing unit into the unit. Here you would have your heat pump coil. That heat pump coil either warms or cools the air that the fan blows over it. And above here we have the electric resistance supplementary heater. So on those coldest days, below kind of minus 25 with current technology, when the heat pump just can't quite keep up with the demand, the electric resistance heater will turn on a modulating amount to make sure that the temperature going out is correct to keep your house nice and toasty warm. So the other advantage using this type of equipment is it looks like a traditional furnace. So the subtrades know how to install it and there isn't a large learning curve with it. And also you can use a traditional humidifier or a steam humidifier with this because there's enough airflow and that allows you to control the humidity that is going out to the house so that in our cold, dry, prairie winters, we can control the humidity so it's in that nice range that we like to see. We're here in the basement in the lungs of the house in front of an ERV or an HRV. HRV stands for heat recovery ventilator and ERV stands for energy or enthropy recovery ventilator. An HRV only recovers the heat, ERV recovers heat and moisture. And how it does that is it uses the exhaust air coming from the house. So this is the stale, warm, moist air and it comes from the house, it goes through this membrane core in the ERV, the tube, it crosses with the supply air, doesn't touch, but it crosses and it allows the recovery and exchange of that heat and moisture into our supply air that is fresh, but it now leaves the machine warmer and more moist. You can also see in this unit that we have filters, both on the supply and the exhaust. And those filters are there obviously to make sure that the air that's coming from outside might have contaminants like pollen or dust or dirt or smoke, but the filters take it all out so that by the time the air goes into your house, it is fresh and clean and you end up with great indoor air quality. So deep energy retrofits and using heat pumps in our cold climates um, are definitely a kind of growth industry or an area we need to continue to grow. So that's why we uh, had this video and there's another video on uh, the new build mechanical system. It actually looked very similar. Um, both of the ERVs are obviously integrated into the uh, ducted uh, air handler uh, unit of or ducts of the space. Um, so yeah, another, another different type of videos that we are showing. 
right, so now, again, maybe just to continue some of the different variety of, uh, of videos, um, let's go over to one that is a little more on the building science side um, and specifically talking about the difference between air barriers and vapor barriers. And this is kind of where we found that there was still a fair amount of um, inconsistency or um, unknowns on exactly what the differences between those two types of uh, membranes are. So that's why we did this video to help kind of clear up some of that um, um, unknowns. So let's have a bit of a conversation about air barriers and vapor barriers. And to start, we should really be calling these vapor control layers and air control layers because it's a combination or a system of a whole bunch of materials that go together to become a control layer. It's not individual products. So our vapor barrier or our vapor control layer, its role is to control the flow of moisture through solid materials. So because of that, if our vapor control layer is, say, 99% there, then it is 99% effective because it is only dealing with the flow of moisture through the solid materials. Our air barriers, or our air control layers, they are dealing with controlling and minimizing the flow of air. And when you have air movement, you have moisture moving with it. So they're controlling the flow of air through a hole. So because of that, they are driven by pressure. If you have a small hole, a lot of air and moisture can move through it. So if your air control layer is only 99% complete, it is not 99% effective. Let's talk a bit about the movement of moisture through our vapor control layer and our air control layer. So if we have a four by eight sheet of vapor barrier material, over one heating season, about 0.3 liters of moisture will transfer through diffusion through that solid four by eight sheet of material. Conversely, if we have only a one inch by one inch hole in our air control layer, because of pressure and the other drives, 30 liters of water will move through that small hole over one heating season. So it's a factor of 100 between a four by eight sheet of vapor control material and a one inch hole in our air barrier. So because of that, our air barrier is far more critical than our vapor barrier. Air tightness first, vapor control second. The other extension of that is a hole in your vapor control layer is now an air barrier problem because the vapor barrier is controlling moisture moving through solid materials. So those holes are air barrier problems. Talking a little bit more about the materials that we can use in our vapor control layer. As per Canadian building code, the materials that can be part of our vapor control layer have to have various material properties. The most important one of these material properties is the permeance. Permeance is a measure of how much moisture moves through that material. Higher perm or higher permeance materials, more moisture. Less perm, less moisture. So if I Canadian code a material that has less than one perm of material property can be used as your vapor barrier. It's broken up into a class one vapor barrier and a class two vapor barrier. The class one is between zero and 0 0.01 perms. These are kind of your plastics, your polys, your metal, and your glass. Think of like a plastic raincoat. Your type two vapor barriers are 0.1 to one perms. These are kind of like your Gore-Tex jacket. Examples of them that we use in building are our synthetic vapor barrier membranes, plywood, OSB, and various other materials that have that correct permeance. The advantage of using a type 
to vapor barrier material within your vapor control layer is that it has that slightly larger permeance, so it allows slightly more moisture to travel through it, which means that in the summer, it can dry out better. So and it will still control the amount of moisture that enters the wall assembly in the winter, but in the summer, it can dry out, and that at wall assembly, any moisture that gets in will get back out. The analogy is it's much more comfortable to go for a jog in a Gore-Tex jacket, which would be more of your type 2 vapor barrier, than a plastic rain poncho because it allows some of the moisture to go through it. In our Bragg Creek house, we can remember that they used a plywood as part of their vapor control layer. And because they had sufficient insulation outside of that plywood, they actually were able to use that plywood as a combined air and vapor barrier. In addition to the plywood, they had to use the correct tapes to make sure that it was taped together, using all those materials to make a complete air control layer and a complete vapor control layer. To try to condense all this into a few easy to remember phrases, we say air tightness first, vapor control second, or we can also say that we want air tight but vapor open wall assemblies. And by vapor open, we just mean we use a type two vapor barrier material instead of a type one. When we're talking about where the air control layer and the vapor control layers go, they go in specific places. The vapor barrier in our cold climate must go on the inside or the warm side of the wall because it is trying to control and minimize that amount of moisture that is moving from our higher relative indoor humidity to the lower outdoor relative humidity. So it's controlling that flow of moisture through solid materials from the inside to the outside. So it has to be on the inside warm side of the wall. Our air control layer, because it is trying to control the amount of air movement through holes, and that is driven primarily through pressure, and pressure can be in different directions, your air barrier can be anywhere within the wall. And in high performance homes, we are seeing a movement towards two air barriers. You have a primary air barrier and you have a secondary air barrier. So often we are seeing the exterior sheathing or the exterior WRB used as our primary air barrier or air control layer. And then that interior vapor barrier, we are also taping the seams and detailing it so it can act as a secondary air control layer. But the primary one is on the outside because the sheeting is nice and flat, it is easier to keep that uh, membrane material continuous. On the inside, we have to go around all the floor joists, the rim joists, and everything else. So it's easier to have your primary air barrier on the outside, secondary air barrier on the inside, combining it with your vapor barrier. All right, I think I'll end that one there. So just kind of, again, a little bit of building science uh, that might be helpful to, uh, to different people in the audience or definitely the, the newer kind of carpenters and uh, trades coming up, just learning. So hopefully, like we could go on, there's a few, and obviously there's full two hours that we can't show in just this one hour section. So I think we might stop the videos at that point. And let me just switch back to my slides quickly. So hopefully that you guys saw some uh, some use in those videos and uh, hopefully you maybe come past us Alberta members so you can like take a look at the full two hours worth of them and see if they might be useful in any of the, the companies or educational organizations that you work for. Um, again, this is the contact info for Beyond Code if you want to contact them uh, to access some of their high performance uh, 3D models. And then here's just some uh, contact info for uh, Passive House Alberta, if you have any questions. And I am the host of the video series. So I am in most of the videos, but in as many locations as we could, we did diversify with different speakers talking about different items um, wherever we could, because we don't always just wanna hear kind of the same uh, person uh, talking, i.e. me. So, there's still about kind of 10 minutes left. So I'm kind of happy to answer any questions or have any discussions because lots of the kind of um, processes or even techniques that we show, there might be some differences in opinions on how the things need to be done. And that's kind of why we always want that kind of instructor presenting these videos to kind of 
finish the conversation because we these are very good at starting the conversation but they might need the instructor to help kind of finish the conversation or clarify some of the questions that come up from watching the videos so if there is any questions that came up from those videos i'm happy to uh, kind of answer them now So again, we will go, uh, I guess I will go over once more, just clarify. So right now to pass those buildings or passive buildings, Canada uh, members, there isn't access, but if you become a passive house Alberta member, which for individuals is only $40 a year, then you get free view only access to all of these videos. And if you want to use them more as kind of a commercial institutional educational, um, process, then there is uh, the costs here for uh, kind of the five year contract to use the videos, edit the videos um, as you want in your uh, educational um, courses and training. But yeah, if you just want free um, view only access as an individual, just become a Passive House Alberta member um, at PassiveHouseAlberta.com and it's only $40. So I guess if there isn't any other questions um, after that, then um, yeah, I guess Kim, we can come on and kind of wrap it up or end the recording and we can have some, some off the record um, discussions if people are kind of holding back because they don't want to be uh, on the record. <laughs>